Hello, my name is Dave Bowden, a Marquee Team Staff Writer here at Ballotpedia. On September 14th, voters in California will vote in a recall election seeking to remove Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, this is obviously one of the biggest political stories this year, in part because we're talking about the most populous state in the country, and in part because it just doesn't happen very often. So since 1921, three sitting governors have faced recall elections. Um, former North Dakota Governor Lynn Frazier was voted out of office in a recall election in that state in 1921. Scott Walker uh, was the governor of Wisconsin. He retained his seat in a recall election in that state in 2012. And then the third instance uh, was in 2003 when California uh, Democratic Governor Gray Davis was recalled uh, in a process not too dissimilar from the one we're gonna talk about and replaced by Republican Arnold Schwarzenegger. So will Newsom face the same fate as Davis or will he see out the rest of his term which ends uh, in 2022? Uh, and by the way, this is the 55th recall attempt or recall effort against the governor of California. So we're gonna leave the result uh, or speculation about the result to the political pundits but we wanted to give you all the information you need to know about this recall. How did it start? Who's running? What is the current polling? Who's raising the most money? Uh, and these are all the questions that we're going to try to answer in today's briefing. So to help me do that today is Joel Williams, who is another staff writer on our marquee team. Uh, thanks for being here, Joel. Happy to be here. All right. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, how did this recall campaign begin? Uh, and why is Newsom a, a target of, of a recall? So this recall campaign that triggered the election is actually the fifth of six different recall attempts against Newsom since 2019. Um, Orrin Heatley, who's a resident of Folsom, California, filed the recall with the state in June of 2020. And he cited some policy issues such as tax rates, homelessness, and immigration as reasons for Newsom's recall. Um, to recall Newsom, Heatley would have to collect about 1.5 million signatures. The recall drive initially collected about 55,000 signatures in its first two months, and then reported collecting less than 1,000 between August and October. Um, and then in November, two things happened that would alter the course of the recall drive to get us here. So the first one is on November 6th, a Sacramento, Sacramento County Superior Court judge extended the deadline for signature collection from November 17th to March 17th, 2021. The judge cited difficulties brought on by the coronavirus pandemic for signature collection as the primary reason for the four month extension. That same night, Newsom attended a dinner party at the French Laundry, which is a restaurant in Napa. And then about two weeks later, photos emerged of him at the event across state media outlets. He was pictured indoors with a number of guests and not wearing a mask. So recall proponents used this to paint Newsom as a hypocrite on his own coronavirus mandates and turn the recall away from Heatley's policy issues towards a more general referendum on Newsom's handling of the pandemic. The organizers collected more than 440,000 signatures in November and ended up collecting more than 2.1 million. All right, Joel, thank you. That's a, great, uh, that's a great summary of how we got here. So after recall proponents then turned in those signatures, um, what, what happened next? Um, there are a couple more procedural steps between that and the recall election. Um, so first, the Secretary of State's office had to verify that all the signatures were valid and of actual voters and people that live in California. Um, so of the 2.1 million that got turned in, 1.72 million of those were deemed valid by that office. Um, voters were then given a window of time to withdraw their signature from the petition, which 43 voters took advantage of. So that gave us a grand total of 1,719,900 valid signatures for the recall. Okay, got it. So the recall proponents uh, have pivoted to, to frame this race about Newsom's uh, response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so how is Governor Newsom framing the events associated with the recall? Newsom's taken pretty much every opportunity to make the case to voters that this is really a partisan Republican effort. Um, in a March 2021 statement, he said that the recall was, quote, backed by the RNC, anti-mask and anti-vax extremists and pro-Trump forces who want to overturn the last election and have opposed much of what we have done to fight the pandemic. Um, he put pretty similar language in the official voter guide that the Secretary of State sends to all registered voters. He actually won't appear on the ballot as a Democrat, though. He missed a paperwork filing deadline last year, 
but the Democratic Party has coalesced behind him and the state party has been pretty active in spending in the election. Yeah, and that brings up a really interesting point. And we talked about this race a couple of days ago um, in the fact that a recall election, much like a ranked choice voting uh, election, is a completely different uh, process. And it's, you know, sometimes there's just completely different approaches. So let's talk a little bit more about how the state Democratic Party in California has responded to this series of events. And as I understand it, it's quite a bit different than how the state Democratic Party responded in the 2003 recall of Governor Gray Davis, right? Yeah, it definitely is. So in 2003, Democrats tried to keep a well-known contender from appearing on the ballot. But kind of at the last minute, L Lieutenant Governor Cruz Bustamante um, filed a run in the campaign, and his slogan was, no on recall, yes on Bustamante. He ended up getting second in that race behind Arnold. He got 2.7 million votes to Arnold's 4.2 million. Um, but the state party and much of the media at the time blamed him for the loss. They speculated that his appearance on the ballot gave independent and Democratic voters more of a reason to vote for the recall of Davis and replace him with someone who at the time would have been the first Latino governor of California. Um, this time around, there's no known political figure on the Democratic side of the ballot to give voters that same draw. Um, most commentators have chalked that up to Newsom's relative popularity compared to Gray Davis, um, but also his perceived tighter grip on the state party. Um, Newsom and most of the state party have been campaigning heavily for a no vote on the recall, going so far as to recommend that people who vote no on the first question also leave the replacement question blank. Um, there's really only one Democratic candidate with any traction in the polls in the media, and that's 29-year-old YouTuber Kevin Paffrath. Um, he actually polled highest in a poll in early August among all our replacement candidates. So um, if Democratic voters ignore the idea of leaving that second question blank, he might be the one they end up voting for. All right, that's fascinating. And that's a great set of, you know, divergences between how they've responded, the Democratic Party responded in 2021 versus how they did almost 20 years ago. Um, now, uh, how has the Republican Party in California or, or Republican uh, folks in, in California, how have they responded to the recall? What, what's been their strategy? Uh, so their strategy is pretty much the opposite of the Democratic one. Um, of the 46 candidates running in the election, 24 of them are Republicans. And uh, there's some pretty big names in the field. You'll see their faces on screen right here. Um, the front runner, uh, or who's considered the front runner by most media and the local beat writers, is radio host Larry Elder. Um, you've also got former San Diego Mayor Kevin Falconer, who's behind him in most of those metrics, but um, is considered by political pundits to be more of like a centrist candidate that could appeal to some Democrats and independents. Um, some other names you might recognize if you follow California politics are 2018 gubernatorial candidate John Cox. Um, he toured the state in recent months with both a bear and a giant ball of garbage as a kind of campaign events. Um, state Board of Equalization member Ted Gaines, Assemblyman Kevin Kiley, and former Olympian and television personality Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, the state Republican Party has actually chosen not to endorse a candidate in the recall. Um, they had a virtual nominating convention. Um, to vote on one, but delegates ended up voting not to endorse. Um, party leaders praised this vote, and um, they're more of the strategy of the more candidates we run, the more voters they might turn out. And they were looking at the no endorsement as a way to not exclude anybody. So like if they were to endorse Kevin Falconer, for example, they were afraid that Larry Elder voters might not end up voting. Yeah, those are two pretty much totally different uh, potential potential strategies. And like I said, in my mind, uh, maybe I'm the only one who thinks this way, I think the parallels to how uh, sometimes candidates and parties approach ranked choice voting um, is, is very similar here. Uh, so, all right, let's, let's get into the numbers a little bit. Let, let's get into, into some polling numbers. And, and, and really, Joel, what is, what is the polling really telling us? So of the 14 polls we've tracked since January 2021, 12 of them have found no don't recall to be the winning choice. Um, but in the last month or so, the polls have tightened pretty considerably, and now most of them are within the margin of error or pretty close. Um, and fewer voters over time are polling as undecided. Uh, we have a bit of an outlier poll here earlier this month um, with Survey USA, where they found that recall would win 51-40 with 9% undecided. Um, and then on the replacement candidate side, other and undecided are still the two options that poll highest among respondents. Um, for actual candidates, though, Elder has had 
pretty steady support in the high teens and low 20s um, since the first polls came out in mid-July. Uh, Pafrath is really the only Democratic candidate to stand out in the polling, and his rise has really just been in this past month um, when some more media pieces have been written about him and things like that. I um, mean, he actually won that same Survey USA poll with a 27% to Elders 23%. Um, and then one more set of polling we can talk about is the University of California, Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Sciences does a quarterly poll of Newsom's approval ratings. And their most recent poll from this July showed that 44% um, of respondents disapprove strongly with his performance, 7% disapprove somewhat, 23% approve somewhat, and 25% approve strongly. So if you combine those, that's like 51% disapprove to 48 approve, and then 1% undecided. Wow, that's a great breakdown, both of the polling on the recall, the approval rating, and also on the candidate side. Um, so it's it's really kind of neat that we have all of this accumulated uh, accumulated data. All right, so we've talked a lot about um, we've talked a lot about some of these elements, but I think now might be a really good time to explain how the mechanics of this actual recall election are going to work because it is a very specific process. So Joel, can you walk us through those? Sure. So the recall election is going to have two different questions on the ballot that voters see. Um, the first one's pretty simple. You see it on screen there. It's should Gavin Newsom be recalled? And if more people vote no than vote yes, recall's over, Newsom stays in office. Um, if more people vote yes than no, then Newsom gets recalled and someone will replace him. And that's where the second question comes in. So on the second question, it's just a list of all the candidates and you pick one and whichever candidate gets the most votes on the second question is going to win. So it's kind of a ridiculous example. If 45 of the 46 candidates got one vote each and the other person got two, the person that got two votes would be the next governor of California. Um, so you don't have to hit a 50% threshold. You just have to have the plurality of the vote. Um, and so that's how Arnold won in 2003 with 48% of the vote. Got it. Got it. And I mean, 48% is not too far from a, a 50% uh, majority, although obviously that wasn't required. Uh, from what I've read, there's a lot of folks that don't uh, don't expect that the winning candidate will get close to uh, Schwarzenegger's 48%. Um, but but this is all, this is all going to be fascinating to watch. Um, so in a way, all of that discussion about how the mechanics of this recall will work kind of brings us back to the strategy that the Democratic Party is pursuing in California. So can someone vote not to recall Newsom um, and then also vote for another candidate anyway? And then as a second question, can they write in someone, like a different politician, maybe like the state's lieutenant governor or uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Antonio Villarosa? Uh, you know, what options are available there? Yeah, those are great questions and ones I think plenty of voters in California have. So to your first question about voting no on the recall and yes on a candidate, um, voters can definitely do that and it will count their vote for the replacement candidate. Um, that's basically the same message that Bustamante ran on in 2003. Um, I think the key difference here is that Democrats are hoping by telling people not to vote for anyone on the second question, they're less likely to vote yes on the recall. Um, but doing that you know, eliminates a potential vote from the second round if Newsom gets recalled. So there's kind of like a catch 22 situation there. Um, in terms of writing candidates, that's something that's been speculated about pretty heavily in the last few weeks, um, especially in the press. Um, since there's no real proven democratic politician for voters to coalesce around, um, voters are allowed to vote for whoever they want. And the rules are pretty lenient in California in terms of voting a write-in. You only have to produce what the law calls a reasonable facsimile of the name on your ballot. So misspelling a name like Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis or Villaragosa wouldn't count it out. Um, the caveat to that is that the votes will only count if the person filed the paperwork to qualify as a write-in candidate. So let's say that Villaragosa gets 51% of the vote through a write-in campaign. Um, if he didn't file the write-in candidate paperwork, that won't matter and the winner is gonna be whoever got the next most votes. Um, we won't know who the qualified writing candidates are until September 3rd, um, but we'll have those up on Ballotpedia once we know. That, that's really fascinating. And, and once again, this brings to mind uh, the differences among states and how they conduct elections. Like, you know, so certain states, uh, you have to spell a writing candidate's name exactly. Um, uh, for example, uh, Lisa Murkowski in, in Alaska, that 
they only counted votes where her name was spelled exactly. Whereas here, as you said, the, the rule is you have to just, you know, be a, a reasonable facsimile to that. Um, so uh, all of this, all of this is just adds to the, to, to the interesting aspect of, of this recall. So I guess then what you're saying is depending on who files as a write-in candidate, which we'll know, you know, after next week, um, it could determine whether or not Democrats have a secondary option on the ballot or not. Um, so that's going to be definitely something to watch. Uh, now let's look at one more set of numbers, uh, and that is fundraising. Uh, what does the fundraising look like so far in this recall? So fundraising for this race is pretty unique. There's almost like two parallel tracks of fundraising going on. So you have your candidate committees, which are pretty standard in any election we cover at Ballotpedia. And you have um, registered committees to support a yes or a no vote on the recall question. And those function basically like ballot measure committees, which we've also covered um, extensively on California propositions before. Um, so all this data is through July 31st. And that was what the most recent um, campaign finance filing deadline covered. So on the ballot measure committee side, the opposition committees have raised about $50 million and they've spent $21.5 million. Um, support committees have raised $8.7 million and spent $8.6 million. Um, and just as reference of the 31 citizen initiated measures on the ballot in California from 2016 to 2020 that we've covered on Ballotpedia, um, the average combined contributions for and against were $50.6 million. So we've already surpassed that average and um, it's only gonna go up from here. Um, in terms of the candidate fundraising, it's kind of reversed. So Republican replacement candidates have raised about $16 million and spent 11 and a half million. And then Democratic replacement candidates have raised about $400,000 and spent $410,000. Basically all of that is PAFRAF. He and only one other Democrat have even filed the campaign finance summaries with the state. Got it. Um, all right, that's a great breakdown then of, of the campaign fi finance numbers. All right, before we get into talking about endorsements, I'm going to throw you a curveball, Joel. I apologize, but we had a really interesting question pop up in the chat. And I don't know if you know the answer to this question, and that is, uh, in what order will the candidates be listed uh, on the recall ballot? Do you know uh, how, how they're being presented? Yes, and it depends on the county that you're in. Wow. So they did like a randomized drawing of candidates. They like assign them numbers and then those numbers get randomized by the counties. So I've seen some people talking on Twitter where there's certain ballots where Larry Elder's appearing like right above the fold line and people are saying, you know, is this some sort of secret trick to not get him elected? Um, but it's entirely random. We have one on Ballotpedia that's a sample ballot from one county. And I'm sure if you looked at that compared to another one, it would be totally different. Uh, so I guess, are you saying then that each county is consistent within the county, but the ballot will be different from one county to another? I believe that's the case, but I'm not entirely sure. Got it. Got it. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. And thanks very much for that question. Um, all right. Uh, sorry to throw you that curveball, but uh, let's go back to what we were going to talk about. And that is uh, what do the landscape of endorsements look like? I imagine they are pretty much all over the map. Yeah, so on the first question to recall Newsom, which we're tracking like a support opposition for, um, it's about what you'd expect. So on the yes side, there are several Republican members of the state's congressional delegation, the Orange County Register, which is a famously pretty conservative newspaper, um, and then former actor, acting director of national intelligence, Richard Grenell. And then on the no side, you've got President Biden, Vice President Harris, Nancy Pelosi, the state party, um, and your more usual papers like the Los Angeles Times, Sacramento Bee, and the San Diego Union Tribune. Um, the replacement candidate endorsements are where you get a little bit more diversity. Um, no one has actually outright endorsed Pafrath, who's the lone Democrat that's polling pretty well or raising money. Um, and that's down to the state party strategy there. Um, in terms of news outlets, the endorsements are pretty split. So the LA Times, even though they endorse no on recall, they didn't choose to endorse no one. So they endorsed Falconer instead. Um, and so is the Bakersfield Californian. The Orange County Register and Los Angeles Daily News, which are both part of the same um, news group, endorsed Elder. And then the internet outlet Red State endorsed Kevin Kiley. Um, in terms of elected officials and their endorsements, Falconer has the most. He's gotten the support of Congressman Issa, the minority leaders of each state legislative chamber and 13 other state legislators. Um, Larry Elder has the support of Congressman LaMalfa, 
and a state senator and state assembly member. Um, and then just in terms of other sort of noteworthy endorsements, Larry Elders got the endorsements of former NYC Mayor Rudy Giuliani, political commentator Megan Kelly, actor Chuck Norris, the American Independent Party, the California College Republicans, and the Lincoln Club of Orange County. Um, and just some other endorsements. Kevin Kiley has the support of recall organizer Orrin Heatley and former Congressman Doug Osi, who actually dropped out of the race, um, I think a week and a half ago after having a heart attack. Um, and then Caitlyn Jenner has been endorsed by Tommy Lahren. Wow, that is quite the list of endorsements and, and not at all un unexpected given, given the wide field of candidates. Uh, and I imagine we'll be seeing more of those uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, as I said, the election is, is September 14th. Uh, so based on everything we've talked about here, uh, you know, we're gonna be in for an exciting election and a very news filled uh, in the next few weeks as, as we go through these developments. Um, all right, so we have a, a few more questions I wanna ask you, Joel, if we could, um, that some folks uh, sent to us uh, when they registered. Uh, so I was hoping I could, I could get your opinions on, on some of those before we wrap up. So um, first of all, how is voting uh, going to be conducted in this race in California? Um, I, I've heard it's, it's all by mail. Is that right? Generally, yes. So it's going to be primarily done by mail, but there are some opportunities, and you'll see them on the screen, um, for people to vote in person early in specific counties. Um, so earlier this year, Newsom signed a law that made elections in the state in 2021 vote by mail in response to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. This is just like an extension of last year's policies. Um, and that bill applied to this election and counties had until the 16th of August to mail all their ballots to register voters. All right, so presumably everybody in California should have received their, their mail-in ballot by, by now. All right, so that leads into the second question. If uh, a resident of California is not registered to vote yet, uh, by when do they need to do that in order to be eligible to, to vote in this recall election? So the deadline for that is going to be August 30th. And that's the date the, po the registration form either has to be postmarked by or delivered to a county's elections office. And then once you register, you can either vote in person at one of those counties if you live there, or you can request a mail ballot. Got it. All right, and now I'm gonna throw you one quick curveball question, Joel, and that was another one that was dropped in the chat, which I thought was really interesting, and I do not know the answer to this. If Newsom is recalled, can he run again in 2022? Do you know the answer to that question? I believe he can. I've seen speculation, people prognosticating like, okay, what happens if this happens or whatever? Um, and I have seen some articles suggest that Newsom can run again. I don't think he's barred from ever, it's not like, um, impeachment where like he would be barred from holding the office again yeah I, I believe i believe i've read things to that effect as well so I, I i would concur with that but that that's that's a great question so again thank you for sending that in all right this has been uh thanks again for answering those questions joel and this has been uh you know just a really fascinating breakdown of what's going to be a really amazingly interesting period and a, an amazing political event uh that, that's going to be unfolding over the next few weeks so thank you for joining us and, and for breaking everything down joel yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so um, I know there were some other questions that, uh, that we weren't able to get to. If you send those questions to uh, editor at ballotpedia.org, uh, we'll route them over to Joel and, and try to get, a, get an answer for you. Um, I hope you enjoyed this look at this upcoming recall election of California Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, as we've done all along, we're gonna continue to follow this race very closely, both on our website and in our newsletters. And on election night, we're gonna be providing uh, coverage of the results as they're made available. Uh, and as we noted before, the election is gonna be conducted uh, primarily by mail. So it's likely going to include updates after September 14th. Um, you know, I, I, I think we can expect that, that, that this results are going to take, uh, take some time to, to unfold. Um, if you're new to Ballotpedia, this is, this is the level of research and analysis that we do on prominent elections across the country every year. So in just a second, I'm gonna tell you how, we, how to stay on top of all the things we do. But I wanna remind you first that we at PD rely on donations for all of the coverage that we offer. So if you like our work and you wanna support us, please consider donating by going to uh, www.ballotpedia.org forward slash donate. And there you can see the ways in which you can contribute and make our coverage possible. So uh, now to stay connected on this story and on all stories uh, about politics, um, 
you can regularly visit our homepage, which is ballotpedia.org, and there we feature the latest political news along with uh, links to our major coverage areas and, and any kind of analyses that we do. Uh, and then the other way to stay informed is through our newsletters. Uh, and these cover a wide variety of topics from election policy to the federal courts, pretty much everything else in between. So there's a link on our homepage to our full listing of newsletters. If you've never subscribed, let me recommend our flagship uh, political news summary called The Daily Brew. It comes out every single weekday, it averages about eight to 900 words each issue. So it's a really quick read of three top political stories every day. So like I said, click on the homepage, you can view samples and subscribe to whichever newsletters that you like. So anyway, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, have a great day uh, and thanks for watching.